Howdy, I'm Bob Terry. Welcome to the Forsaken Westerns. Up next, we have a tele audition, which is another name for a pilot. This pilot never launched. It's only about 12 minutes long, and they might have been shooting for a 15 minute time slot, which happened back in the 1950s. And we have two of the biggest stars from the 1940s and the 1950s in this pilot. Now, our main title character here is Curly Bradley. Some of you may know who Curly Bradley is. Curly Bradley started in movies as a stunt double when he was a teenager. And he was stunt doubling for Hoot Gibson, Tom Mix, and Buck Jones. He said he got tired of being busted to bits, but he loved to sing, so he started concentrating on his music career. Well, he belonged to several groups, including a group called the Beverly Hillbillies. But him and some other guys got together in the early 30s and started a group called the Ranch Boys. They quickly moved to Chicago and right away got a job at NBC. And they did a few things for NBC, but then they hit the big time. They landed parts on the Tom Mix radio show. They did the music and they were ranch hands. And in 1944, Curly landed the title part in the Tom Mix radio show as the voice of Tom Mix. Our other star was in It's a Wonderful Life as Tommy Bailey. He was in several westerns, including Destry with Audie Murphy and Savage Frontier with Alan Rocky Lane, Winchester 73 with James Stewart. He also did some TV westerns, Death Valley Days for instance, but most of you'll remember him as Tag Oakley in the 80 episodes that he did of the Annie Oakley series. Of course, it's Jimmy Hawkins. And he stars as Rusty in this episode. And Curly Bradley stars as the title character. The title of this is Curly Bradley, Singing Marshall. Sit back, relax, kick your boots up, and enjoy this. And we'll see you after the show. As he rides along, haunting strains of the martial song. like you've got the drop on me, partner. Yeah, and there's nothing to smile about. I might shoot you yet. Don't tell me you shoot everybody who walks by that rain barrel. Just about. And you're next. <laughs> you know, if that happened to you in a real gunfight, Rusty, you'd be in a tight spot. Here, let me help you out of that barrel. How do you know my name is Rusty? Oh, I make it a point to learn the name of every new bad man that comes in the territory. I know who you are. You're the marshal here, aren't you? Curly Bradley. Right. Happy to make your acquaintance, Rusty. Wait a minute. If you're a Western marshal, why didn't you reach for your gun when I drew on you? Ooh, maybe I never thought it was necessary. Well, you've got a gun. Sure. Well, then what's the matter? Don't you know how to use it? <laughs> See that tin can out there? Sure. Well, keep your eye on it. Holy smoke! I didn't even see a draw. Very few people have, Rusty. I don't reach for my gun very often. A Western Marshal? And you don't use your guns? Well, Rusty, you'd be surprised how few times a Marshal needs to if he keeps his wits about it. But what if you get in a tight spot? 
Hmm, that depends on what kind of a spot you mean. I remember one time when my deputy, Red Rivers, and I were returning from some business we'd been on over at Bear River. We just turned onto the road to Central City, close to where the tracks of the Carlisle Railroad ran, when suddenly Red spotted something. Two men, one of them dead, handcuffed together down in a gully. Hey, give me a hand, will you? What seems to be the trouble here? Oh, I'm a deputy sheriff. My name's Henry Jenkins. Uh, my credentials are right here. I was taking this hombre back to Rimrock by train this afternoon. What did he do? Try to make a getaway? Yeah, he sure did. He yanked me off the back platform of the train while I was going at top speed. Jumping catfish. You're lucky he didn't kill you. Yeah. Well, he wasn't so lucky. Must have been pretty desperate to take a chance like that. Well, I was taking him back to Rimrock to stand trial for murder. I guess he knew he'd hang. Well, I guess we've come along just at the right time. This here is Curly Bradley, the marshal, and I'm his deputy, Red Rivers. Well, I'm glad to know you. Curly. Uh, would you mind helping me out of these handcuffs? I lost my key. Oh, sure. I think I've got a skeleton key that'll just fit him. Hold it a minute, Red. Well, what's the matter? I think we'll leave those cuffs right where they are, Mr. Burton. What, were you crazy? I'm, I'm Jenkins. This is Burton here. Not the way I see it. <laughs> Hold it. I thought so. Cover him, Red. What's this all about, Curly? Our friend here, who was really Mr. Burton, overlooked something when he tried to pose as Jenkins, the deputy he killed. See how he's got that gun stuck in his belt? Looks natural enough to me. It is natural, if you're left-handed, and this man is. He proved it just now when he went for his gun. Well, what's the matter with that? Couldn't he be a left-handed deputy sheriff? Sure, but if he were left-handed, and this man is, he wouldn't manacle his gun hand to a desperate criminal. Now, there was a case where I could have used my gun when Burton went for his. But if I had, and it had turned out later he was just a trigger-happy peace officer instead of the escaped criminal I suspected, sure, I'd have been sorry, but it had been too late. Yeah, but he was a criminal, just like you thought. Sure, but the thing you've got to remember is the same kind of thinking that made me suspect him in the first place is what kept me from going for my gun before I was certain. Yeah, but aren't there times you have to shoot? Oh, you bet your life. Many times I've had to shoot mighty straight and fast. You ever hear of an hombre named Ruth Lowry? Yeah. He was a bank robber, wasn't he? That's the man. Bank robber, kidnapper, and killer. And he was just smart enough to know other criminals aren't. So he used to work alone. Lowry planned robberies just like a general plans battles, even to the getaway trail and the hideout he was going to use. Red and I had heard that Lowry was in the territory, and we expected trouble. We knew if he did attempt to hold up the bank in Central City, he'd strike fast and unexpectedly. We couldn't be sure of being there when it happened, so we tried to figure out the nearest place he'd be likely to make for after the holdup. We thought we'd found it in Clay Canyon. A hidden trail high up in the rocks near the north end. Neither of us had ever seen it before. But someone, one man on horseback, had ridden through it not long ago. It looked to be just the kind of a setup Lowry liked. He could ride into Clay Canyon, letting whoever was after him think they'd bottled him up, and then, using the hidden trail, scurry out of the trap before his pursuers even knew what was happening. Red had a few sticks of dynamite in his saddlebags left over from the job of blowing tree stumps we'd done the day before, and I sent him to fetch him. But the trouble with blocking off the draw right then and there was that we didn't know when Lowry figured on using it. There was a narrow shelf of rock jutting out about eight feet above the trail, just at its mouth. I climbed up there with a stick of dynamite and wedged it into the cliffside. Red was to come back later that afternoon and hook the fuse to a plunger box we figured to have hidden back off the trail. The draw still looked like it was an ideal getaway route. Now, when Lowry made for Clay Canyon and we reckoned he'd strike after dark, he wouldn't be likely to notice that charge up in the rocks. So at least we had a chance to cut off his escape. After that, there was nothing we could do but go back about our business and wait. And wait we did. Wait and watch the Central City Bank until 
On the second night, we saw a light flash in the front window. Red and I were crouching in a deserted store across the street. I sent Red around to the north end of the bank so we'd have Lowry blocked from both sides when we started to close in. Either I was moving too slow or Red was a bit too eager. But just as I was coming along the walk under the windows, he was at the door of the bank. Then I heard someone call. Hey, Red, that you, Curly? All right, Curly. Throw down your guns or your pal's a dead man. I thought it was you calling me, Curly. Throw him down, I said. If it hadn't been for me. Never mind, partner. He's heading for Clay Canyon. Come on. Too big a head start. We never would have beat him to that draw. You got your rifle? Yeah, on my saddle. Get it, will you, please? Yeah. Maybe there's more than one way to beat Lowry up to that draw. Here you are. Thanks. Curly, you ain't aiming at Lowry, are you? I've never turned my gun against a man yet. Well, what are you doing? That dynamite over the draw. Too far to the right. Oh, Curly, you ain't never gonna hit a target that small from here with that bean shooter. And at night. There's bright moonlight, and I'm gonna have to. Lowry's almost to the draw. Jumping catfish, Curly, you done it. You blew up the draw. You got a whole Lowry trap. Say, that was some shooting. Boy, I hope I'm not good a shot someday. You gotta remember this, though, Rusty. I'm passing it on to you like my mother passed it on to me. It takes a bigger, better, and braver man to use his wits when he's in trouble than to use his gun. Yeah, but isn't it pretty hard to do it all the time? Sure it is. But when you come right down to it, so is everything that's worth doing. It's pretty hard to hold on to your temper when the other fellow's out to ride. And when a man loses his temper, he usually loses his senses right along with it, and he's liable to do something that he'll regret later on. Oh, you mean like shooting first and asking questions afterward? That's exactly what I mean. You see, the way I figured, there's a right and a wrong way to solve every problem. And if you know the right way, the manly way, and follow it through, everything will come out okay. Remember that, Rusty. You bet you will, partner, and mighty soon, too. Well, that's me, Curly Bradley, the singing marshal. And I was telling Rusty the truth. I will see mighty soon. If, look out now, here comes the commercial. If some smart sponsor grabs me up fast, I'll see Rusty and all the hundreds of thousands of Rusties on the television sets. Just as soon as you say the word. I'm no newcomer to this business, and I realize that in addition to slam-bang action scenes like these, you as a sponsor want an element in your show that will sell what you've got to offer. Well, I like to think that I'm that element, and I've got a pretty good sales record to back up my opinion. Now, if you agree, 
It seems we ought to be able to strike some kind of a bargain. <laughs> but look, even Ranger, my pony's nodding his head. He thinks it's a good idea, too. yippee oh the marshal, song of the marshal, the interesting telly audition. You know, Curly Bradley was in the Beverly Hillbillies Western group in California, as I mentioned before, and they were very popular. So popular, Pat Brady said he never missed a broadcast of the Beverly Hillbillies. As he said, as he walked down the street, everybody was blaring it from their radios in every house he walked past. Thank you for joining us for the Forsaken Westerns. We hope you'll join us again here next time. My name's Bob Terry. Have a great day.